All right. Thank you. Uh, today, I'm joined by Yishan Wang, founder and CEO of Terraformation, Raphael Jovin, founder and chief scientist at Brilliant Planet, and Itasha Cave, co-founder and chief science officer of 12. So before we get into it real quick, um, I want to set the stage a little bit. The IPCC says we'll probably have to remove hundreds of gigatons of CO2 by the end of the century. That's a lot, given that we release currently about 60 gigatons per year when you include include fossil fuel emissions and land use and other sources. Uh, and this year, the IPCC made a notable statement saying that we're probably going to have to re rely on some form of carbon removal to prevent catastrophic warming. So first, I want to talk about scale. Itasha, you and your colleagues at 12 say that you can capture about 10% of global carbon emissions with your technology. How do you do that? And how, what, what will it take for you to get to that scale? Yeah, I mean, when we talk about 10% of global emissions, um, we we actually mean that in a way to, to focus the audience attention, that we're focused on the hard to decarbonize sectors, um, that, you know, we're not going to go after the kind of power plants and, and um, some of the transportation uh, ways in which we emit CO2, but that, you know, uh, industrial sources such as cement, concrete, um, steel manufacturing and uh, intercontinental, intercontinental airline flights are the areas where we really want to focus on. And, you know, to get to 10 percent of global emissions, I mean, that's going to take, uh, you know, some time, at least a decade or so. Um, but what we're hoping is that, uh, you know, we will be one of many players in this space. And as the total global emissions starts to come down and we start to scale up, that we'll get to that 10 percent faster and faster with just, um, not just our technology growing, but also other technologies uh, coming on, on, on the field. This is an all-hands-on-deck moment, for sure. Yeah, and can you describe that technology briefly? Sure. Yeah, so we are a carbon transformation company. Um, we are looking to make basically industrial trees. So the same way a tree takes CO2, water, and electricity – sorry, energy in the form of sunlight um, to convert CO2 and water into sugars, we can take CO2, water, and electricity uh, in an industrial context and convert that CO2 into useful materials and products. So we've made things like jet fuel. We've made uh, materials such as polymers. We've made lenses and sunglasses, component and consumer products such as Tide detergent with Procter & Gamble. So we're really excited about being able to provide an array of carbon materials that we already use and love, but instead of providing having them come from petroleum, we can have them come from CO2. Yeah, and Ishan, terraforma terraformation, I should say, takes a, a pretty different approach, right? Um, you're using actual trees here. What's the opportunity for scale there? Um, it's actually sort of unknown. There's a floor of about maybe 30% of all CO2 emissions. Um, but based on, you know, past historical record or how many trees there were on the planet, it could be up to like three times that. Um, the, the way I, I sort of think of it is, is more that like, you know, a lot of people try to look for the one solution that's going to solve it. And I think it's actually about understanding that you have to apply all of the solutions, right? There, it's, it's very unlikely that there's going to be one solution that dominates all of them and solves the entire problem. And more like, because, you know, emissions come from every sector of the economy. And so you're probably going to have solutions that apply across the entire economy. Yeah, and where do you see your um, solution coming in? Well, one of the nice things about reforestation as a carbon sequestration solution is that it has a lot of like, co-benefits that don't have to do directly with carbon sequestration, right? It's actually one of the best ways of restoring biodiversity um, rather than, like, you know, there's like programs to restore certain species by, you know, capturing them and then breeding them or whatever. But in many case, cases, endangered or vulnerable species are vulnerable because they've lost their native habitat. And so by restoring forests and restoring that native habitat, those populations actually will bounce back very quickly um, as soon as that habitat is restored. Um, and so there's all sorts of co-benefits like, you know, biodiversity restoration, um, erosion control, um, it benefits local communities. Um, and, and so it's actually more like reforestation is a, is a particularly like simple but inclusive um, solution. Like many, many people can work on it. Um, technological solutions. Now, here's the thing. Like I, I, don't, I don't actually want to like 
criticize one solution versus another, right? So it's more like this one has an advantage, other solutions have different advantages. But you know, one of, one of the, the advantages of reforestation is that it's extremely inclusive in terms of like how many countries can implement it and they can all do it in parallel. Um, and, and I think that that's very important for resilience of solutions and, and generally like how much cooperation and collaboration you can achieve across the world for those. Yeah, and Raphael, you take a, a third approach here. Um, can you describe that for us and tell us what opportunities for scale you have? Yeah, it's this, it's a combination of a nature-based solution with um, sort of bringing algae on land. So what we do is we grow natural algal blooms on land year-round as opposed to the natural blooms happening episodically in the ocean, in these coastal oceans. In terms of the scale, we there are about 15 and a half million square kilometers of desert in the world. It's more land than the US and Europe combined. And of that, we have identified about half a million square kilometers of ideal coastal desert that's flat and in politically stable countries with all the right conditions where we can do somewhere between two and five gigatons of carbon if we developed all of those. Just for scale, to compare that, that's about the size of sugarcane crop, what's being done. And again, just like Yishan said, it's something that um, can be democratized. Many countries can do it. It requires very little new technology. And um, just like Tasha said, I mean, it is something that's an all-hands-on-deck moment so we are very much um, focused on doing many technologies. We cannot grow algae in Europe or Iceland or uh, the US, for example, on, because all the coastlines are actively being used for other things. You know, either there is agriculture or forestry and natural resources. And so what we focus on is very much on environmental restoration in the sense that we deacidify a lot of seawater and we focus very much on creating new biomass that would not have grown naturally by itself by bringing that unused ocean water into the desert where it can then work with those local algae to make to draw down carbon so that's that's how we do it yeah, so that deacidification point that you made is interesting. Um, it's an extra plank that I think you're addressing that you don't often hear. Um, can you explain how that works? Yeah, so we, we work with natural systems. So that means our, unlike biofuel or a lot of the sort of systems out there, um, they're low density. They're working on natural levels of nutrients. They're much more dilute. Um, and we sort of the limitations of that we overcome by pumping a lot of water. Um, the rate of CO2 diffusion into seawater is relatively slow. So the algae grow faster than the CO2 that is being consumed from the seawater. So we draw down the total pool of CO2 in the seawater, as well as having a lot of atmospheric transfer. Um, what then happens is when we release and we remove the biomass to sun dry it in the desert and bury it, the seawater actually has, re we've removed the carbonic acid. We've removed that uh, um, dissolved CO2 and it raises the pH. It allows the seawater then to recapture that. So we return for every unit of discharge between five and eight units of local seawater back to its pre-industrial pH state. Importantly, subtlety here is we do not remove alkalinity. We do not remove any of the capacity of the ocean water to reabsorb that CO2. So we, it's, it's, it's a temporary perturbation of the local environment, but it's very important because it allows shell-forming organisms to grow. And how much seawater would you have to filter to meaningfully bring down the amount of acidity in the ocean, would you say? Well, the ocean is a very, very big place. So yeah. this, is a, uh, this is a local phenomenon. Um, we estimate that if we use our system the way that we use it today on a thousand hectare site, that's our first full scale commercial site, we will deacidify um, 
about 50 billion tons of seawater per year, which is somewhere, um, and if you multiply that again by five, uh, that's somewhere the volume of the San Francisco Bay and its entire watershed twice a year. So that's one module of this. And so in a local context, it's important. In a global ocean context, it's a, it is a drop in the ocean. But we want to build lots of these sites around the world. It sounds like replication is the key here. Absolutely. Now, Ishan, my understanding of your terraformation's approach is similar, right? You're looking to build uh, some way to replicate uh, the experience that you have and the technology you're developing in Hawaii, but elsewhere. Is that correct? Um, well, yes. I mean, the, the thing that we've built in Hawaii specifically shows that we can actually produce more fresh water than is generally believed to be available and, and now at a relatively economical means. Um, but what we're actually trying to do is we're trying to relieve bottlenecks to uh, starting more reforestation projects because people have actually been doing this for you know 30 or 40 years and there have been numerous reforestation projects, some of which have been successful and some of which have been failures. Right? And, and through that, we've learned but we collectively as mankind have learned how to successfully restore forests. Like there's a correct way and then there's like this incorrect way. Um, and so in fact, there are a lot of groups that want to do so. And there's a lot of actually money and funding that wants to go into it. But there's this sort of, uh, there's this bottleneck in terms of actually converting that into projects on the ground and enabling them to actually get started. So, so it's not so much actually the technology that we've developed, but rather just um, increasing the pipeline or increasing the throughput of more projects in parallel all over the world. Yeah, and how do you hope to accomplish that? Uh, well, there's a few bottlenecks that we've identified as being really critical ones, um, and they are like uh, financing, right? Like just actually finance, financing vehicles, um, training, tools, and uh, seed supply. So these are four critical bottlenecks that actually need to be tackled all at once because if you tackle one of them and you don't tackle the other ones, the other ones will sort of hold you back. And so you have to address all four at once. Um, and so we're creating accelerator programs to give that help to projects that want to start. Um, and we hope that by doing so, I mean, our intention is um, this will enable more of them to start. It will set an example. Um, and, and sort of like both Rafael and, and Itasha have said, you know, we're not the only ones to do this. Like, if we want to reach meaningful percentages of the carbon sequestration, we're going to need an entire movement, an entire industry, doing all these things in parallel, which we intend to lead, but really we need a lot of people to copy us. So what we're doing is also doing it to set an example and show, like, hey, you know, all of you can do this, right? This is how we do it, right? We need, like, we, 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 we need, like, a thousand copycats, right? This is one of those times when you have a startup where you really want copycats, you want everyone doing right. this all in parallel. And that's that's really the only way we're, we're going to meaningfully achieve the, the scale that we need. Yeah, and Itasha, what kind of bottlenecks are you seeing on your end? What would really free uh, 12 up to reach its potential? Yeah, certainly financing is um, a, a part of that. Um, we, you know, we, we need to build a manufacturing floor, mini manufa manufacturing floors, uh, or mini gigafactories, as you could say. Um, we need to also deploy our systems out and create these uh, industrial forests or these these plants that would, uh, you know, take uh, CO2 from a direct air capture device or from an industrial point source emissions and uh, convert that into a, a usable product. So, um, you know, all that's going to require um, financing and, and, you know, with what we've seen from kind of your more traditional sources of, of financing that, um, you know, because we do have a technological risk associated with our product that can create a, a bit more uncertainty that, that maybe a traditional or conventional provider would want to take. Uh, but luckily, again, this ecosystem is being built and there are um, new sources of project financing that's come on board that's focused on clean tech that's saying, you know, we can um, digest and understand this technological risk and can figure out how to uh you know, basically deal with it and, and, and build that into the project and support first of a kind systems. Um, the federal government in the U.S. is, is doing some of that with um, some larger grant, first of a kind deployment grants that will help companies like myself 
get our system out there, which will be more expensive in the first uh, few plants, but we'll, we'll be coming down the cost curve for future plants. So that's, that's really a key backbone to, to what we need to do. In addition to continuously improving our technology, we've been very focused on costs from the beginning. We want to be cost competitive with a petroleum equivalent. So you don't have to, you know, um, make a, a sacrifice on, on, on price or material. You can have that same material, same cost someday and just lower carbon footprint. And so we, we are, um, you know, building out, you know, ways in which we can bring that cost down through mass manufacturing. This would be the two. Yeah. And Natasha, you said that, um, you're finding investors who are able to digest some of the risk involved, um, in, you know, your technology, other technologies that have similar time horizons, you know, these are all long bets. Has the response from investors, has it changed in recent years? Have you seen? Um, I would say there's, um, yeah, so there's a group of investors that invest in what I would call deep tech. So that's, you know, space technology, um, flying cars, you know, the, the stuff that's like really hard uh, technology to invest in. And I think they have come around to say, OK, let's also include climate tech as part of that. Um, and and then there's uh, some investors who have a mission focus. Maybe they they come from a family office and they're they're saying, like, look, we can you know, jumpstart this industry and get it going. Cause again, it's, it's an ecosystem we have to build. Um, so let's, let's, you know, support the building of this plant that the, you know, industrial seeds. And then, um, once these, you know, technologies and, and processes mature, then they can kind of go on their own, but they're still very young. And so, um, there's been new investors to support that. I, I still will make the case that for a lot of investors, um, you know, it's still very much, uh, you know, profitable and high yield to support uh, software and productivity apps and, and so forth. And I, I don't think there's a lot of um, those type of investors that are coming into the climate tech space, um, which is, you know, just how it is. It is, it is a, a, you know, you are taking on a different type of risk than you would in, in software. Although I would argue the time scale for a lot of times can be very similar. It's just the ramp up is different. So with deep tech, you have a, a long tail and then you can, uh, ramp up really quickly. Um, but with software, you kind of have like a much more, uh, fast ramp where you get product market fit early on and then you can just build and grow. So it's just a different risk profile. Yeah. Ishan and Raphael, have you seen, um, something similar with investors over the last few years? Has there been a shift? Ishan, do you want to go? Well, yeah, absolutely. Yes, there's been <laughs> there's been much more attention paid to climate investing over the last two years. I, I'm actually thinking about how over the last, I guess, maybe like five years, there's been a dramatic turn towards recognizing the potential of uh, reforestation and, and forest restoration as um, one of the major solutions um, with, with like very good RO. And it's, it has like numerous, like, you know, very good characteristics. Um, as, a, as one of the carbon sequestration solutions. I, I think the the paper that was put out um, from uh, Crowther Labs at ETH Zurich really helped put things on the table, put that on the table, right? Before then, it was kind of a thing that people didn't, you know, only people who were too specialized in the industry sort of knew about it. Um, but once once that paper came out, um, that like, it's like put reforestation on the table as a topic that everyone was discussing. And that really advanced the conversation. Yeah, I, I mean, I agree. Um, Lots of investors have changed their behavior in the sense that they're looking outside of their areas of comfort and they've set up either new climate funds or sort of um, are, as Itasha is outlining, sort of seeding the new growth of things that didn't exist before to create the capabilities and to create sort of a cohort of organizations. And that is really, really helpful. Um, I also see a lot of people struggling in the sense that they know that sort of very large resources need to be deployed to deal with this many gigaton problem in a reasonable time frame. And, and of course, you know, pension funds and people with deep pockets are very reserved and have strong mechanisms to sort of do their due diligence in a very responsible way. 
And that's great. But the fact is, is the challenge is moving faster than maybe some of the funding agencies and certainly the regulators are adapting. And so, yes, we, we do see a wonderful change. I mean, I wrote my original patent, it got granted in 2008 for a method of carbon sequestration, proposing that at the time, this was a non-starter from a commercial and fundraising point of view. Now it's a completely different story. So, yes, there's a lot of change in the industry. Would, would you uh, say the regulatory side has caught up? You know, in the United States, at least, the Inflation Reduction Act, I know, has changed a lot of conversations. Um, have you seen that happening for you? Yeah, so I mean, I, I, I love the fact that there are actual regulatory efforts to try to align MRV and align sort of LCAs across different disciplines to make them more transparent and that there are a lot of new organizations coming in to try to help with that. Um, and there are some very slow but progressive uh, sort of improvements. For example, the European Union every year for the last more than 20 years now has reduced the carbon footprint of agriculture by 1% every year. So in the same way, uh, drawdown and um, various forms of carbon capture are now being considered quite seriously. The European Union is quite pokey and slow. Um, we are working in Morocco. Um, and the Moroccans are half the time completely puzzled by what we do, but they're also showing other forms of support in terms of giving us the access to the land and, um, you know, being very supportive in terms of trying to do the right thing. Morocco has a very good track record in renewable energies, but this is completely outside of their comfort zone. And so, so even if it's not necessarily the, the groundwork hasn't necessarily been laid, a lot of the attitudes have changed. So, so that is helpful, but there's lots of room for improvement too. Yeah, and Ishan and Natasha, have you seen the Inflation Reduction Act change things significantly for your businesses? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's still early days. You know, it, <laughs> we, we have to see how things uh, come through the executive branch and get executed. Um, there's, you know... There's still lots of details that need to be worked out, but so far there are uh, quite a few provisions in the IRA that would definitely help us get to market with production tax credits, investment tax credits, um, manufacturing credits. It's just, it's, uh, yeah, we're really excited about the possibilities. Yeah, that's, um, it's, 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 a, it's sort of optimistic, you know, View view. Uh, it's like there, there are provisions in the IRA that look uh, very positive, and now it's just sort of as it works its way through the pipeline. Which is you know every day you're sort of seeing these weather events. Like every day, the planet is warming, and every day like some bureaucrat looks sort of like shuffles like the paper from their desk to the next desk. So it, it, it's pretty slow. Like I, I I actually feel like you know for all this talk about it being a climate emergency, I don't think anyone actually acts as though it's an actual emergency. Um, you know, I've, along these lines, now that we have some regulatory certainty, you know, even though it's the details are still to be worked out, you know, for at least the next 10 years, um, there are some places where we're seeing a price on carbon. I have heard one investor say that um, they don't put money into things that require the stroke of a pen to make them profitable. What would you all say to them? I'm okay with that, actually. I mean, <laughs> we spent 10 years stripping out energy operational cost and uh, trying to develop high value products, proteins, other things. And so we've thought a lot about how to make this competitive. And like uh, Ishan, we have lots of co-benefits. We create a lot of jobs in the desert. We have other forms of communicating this. Um, and so we can co-locate with other industries. We can find ways of making enough margin to make this investable. Um, and we're, we, um, I believe that we will be able to scale this and make a really big impact if it makes sense for people to apply this in their countries without having a subsidy from 
you know, the U.S. government. I, I'm not, not opposed to subsidies in the sense of actually launching things and in getting investment and things going, but um, I do believe we will be profitable. And there's a lot of good research going on from economists like the Dasgupta Review here in the uh, UK looking at the cost of biodiversity and the benefits, the economic benefits of biodiversity. I mean, Ishan, I'm sure, has lots of opinions on this too. Um, the point is, I think a lot of hard-nosed economists are sort of recognizing that green jobs and other ways of stimulating and buying these um, outcomes uh, will actually stimulate investment and create jobs and create a new industry. So in that sense, I think that's okay. Sorry, wrong answer. No, no, that's good. Um, Ishan, what about you? Well, I think like, you know, as an entrepreneur, you, you don't want to be dependent on any of those things. But as a, you know, like what policies do you advocate? You obviously advocate the ones that are going to help tilt the playing field towards the outcomes that you want, right? Like right now it's like extremely tilted towards fossil fuel extraction companies to, to the point where you have, you have laws that aren't even like, that, that, that aren't even explicitly about fossil fuels, but which end up benefiting them in like this highly structural way, right? So, so you obviously want as many policy shifts in that direction as possible. But at the same time, as an entrepreneur, you, you can't really, you, you don't want to structure your company to sort of depend on those, right? Because you're right, like if, if they don't pass the law in time, even, right? Or if they don't implement the provisions in time, you know, you may not have that time as an entrepreneur. So, you know, there's two things like obviously we favor all, all, all of this policy and regulation, but at the same time, we cannot just say explicitly depend on it. So I sort of understand where like investors are coming as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Itasha, I know you're, you know, 12 is aiming to be cost competitive with fossil fuels. Um, you know, obviously, like Ishan said, there's a lot of current laws and regulations that are tilted in favor of fossil fuels. Do you think you can get there without dismantling any of that? Um, or, you know, would, obviously it would be helpful if the field tilted a little bit more in your favor, correct? Yeah, I, well, I, I wouldn't say um, tilted, when you say tilted it more in, in our favor, that implies that um, it, we would somehow be at an advantage. I mean, we're just asking for this, in some ways, the same things that the um, oil and gas industry has had for the past 150 years. I mean, when they started off, they were getting government assistance uh, in, in all kind of like public and not so public ways. Uh, back in those days, I mean, I think in general, like we from day one, as I said earlier, have been focused on cost. We want to be cost competitive. And at the same time, we recognize that we need to get to market faster. And if we can get there through government assistance, and then, then, yeah, why not? Um, why not have more plants be deployed much quicker? I, I also think, too, I mean, this this idea of like economic rationalism of like, Everything, you know, has to uh, make money, be profitable from day one. I just think it's it's something I think we, we need to really uh, ask ourselves, is that is that an appropriate framework of looking at things? Because our interstate highways, most of our mass transit authorities, most of our infrastructure, the bridges that we, we use to transport across, they, they don't make money. They they were built and, and put in place for the greater good. And, you know, this climate tech and carbon tech has a has a combination of of the two it's you know certainly there for the greater good and it also can make economic sense so so to me like we we do need like a hybrid approach of you know the best way to bring in the in in the um the greater good is through the government that's already kind of distributing funds and collecting funds throughout the population um and so, and then we also need private industry to come along and, and support the growth because private industry is really good at, you know, once a lot of foundational work has been done, like really scaling things, like getting it to that last mile. And so we kind of need both at the table. Excellent. Well, I think that about does it for time today. Uh, I want to thank Raphael, Ishan, and Natasha for joining us. And um, thank you very much. Thank you all. 